Hi, this is your host, Supreme Bhartiya, and today we have with us once again Brian Bellendorf, Chief AI Strategist at the Linux Foundation. Brian, it's great to have you back on the show. Swap, Alex, it's great to be here. Thanks. Yeah, it's my pleasure to talk to you today. Today, we are going to talk about the recent Biden administration's executive order on. AI. Uh, there are a lot of aspects there, securities, there, privacy is there. Before we talk specifically about this, I also want to just look at this administration because a few years ago they talk about S bombs and then also last year Kubernetes hardening. So I want to understand, you know, what has changed because now suddenly we see that US actually is leading in a lot of these uh, areas. When Biden came into office, he brought in uh, a whole lot of technologists and a whole lot of uh, ambition to uh, really taking a very tech forward agenda across cybersecurity, across AI, across a number of domains. Uh, in my previous role at the Linux Foundation, leading the Open Source Security Foundation, we worked quite a bit with CISA and other uh, parts of the White House on cybersecurity, convened a number of summits with them, uh, produced quite a bit of output, and that has meaningfully helped advance the state of security and open source software through their engagement. Uh, uh, completely parallel to that, there's been this obviously effort there uh, to develop their AI policy uh, uh, and to move ambitiously there. And so the publication of this executive order and a couple of the other things that have followed just show um, this really you know huge appetite to to not only lead here but also work not just with industry but also with the open source community and work with foundations and, and other parts of civil society to to have a complete answer here i want to go there but i just want to quickly draw a contrast with european union i mean europe has been ahead when it comes to a lot of grassroots movements happen there MariaDB, mysql linux kernel you know they came from europe but when we look at cra it's a very great you know uh, the idea is great but uh, I talked to a lot of folks, you know, and it was like miscommunication, not talking. So how do you see what is leading to this contrast there where we do see that, hey, working with the community is the right approach versus coming up with laws and then get the community involved? Right. Well, open source, obviously, is a very global phenomenon. A lot of open source activity in act, uh, in, in Europe, uh, of course, also in China and other, other places. Uh, and, and we have followed closely the European Union's um, uh, proposed legislation around the Cyber Resiliency Act and, and and also the AI Act. And the fundamental difference is in Europe, there's this precautionary principle. If we don't quite understand a thing or the possible negative downsides, then perhaps we shouldn't start until we understand completely all the all the all the all the things that could go wrong. But sadly, you don't know all the things uh, until you get started, right? Uh, and so I see in the U.S. executive order around AI, as well as in much of the other engagement, a mix of well, we know there are some harms and some potential bad sides, so let's invest in ways that can mitigate those. But at the same time, invest in ways in taking advantage of AI, taking advantage of open source to help bolster security, right? Take advantage of these kinds of directions. And so that mix of constructive, you know, cautious constructivism uh, is, I think, going to actually uh, uh, be better for, 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 for American businesses and, and for America than, than the European approach. But I also see hopefully the European approach evolving in a similar direction over time since so much of the open source community has been engaging with European Union to help educate them on uh, how open source works and what the potential is here. Uh, to, to do well. Now, let's talk about uh, some of the key ideas and principles behind this executive order from your perspective. Man, it is it is a really thick executive order. There's so much here. And by the way, it's an order um, that tries to shape not just how the private sector operates and not just how, you know, kind of uh, open source operates and, and, and how some of the underlying technologies are built by the private sector, but also is very much a directive to um, the government itself on, on how to move forward and, and how to manage and take advantage of the opportunities here, but to do it safely. Um, but, but some of the things that speak most directly to the open source community um, are things like, you know, right at the very top, require safety results to be shared with the U.S. government. I mean, this kind of thing is easy for us. I mean, it, this and in other parts of the executive order, it calls for transparency. And transparency is the bedrock that open source is built upon, right? The open source community has always shared not just the source code and not just the uh, the list of bugs, um, uh, but also the test results, you know, when there's tests of, that are part of an open source project. And so this is something that's going to be easy for us to do. And I think there's tools that we can build to help even those deploying AI models be able to uh, consistently come up with safety tests uh, and, and report those to authorities, report those to, to auditors, report those to, to their own customers, right?
Um, likewise, there's a real focus on safety and privacy protection across the executive order. Um, uh, and in fact, this is uh, uh, great to see. And, and folks building AI technologies that I know are constantly concerned about not just how do we reduce hallucinations, but how do we uh, mitigate the potential for bias that might be within the data sets that are consumed, uh, and then and thus the resulting models. So there's quite a few efforts, including some uh, at the Linux Foundation AI and Data Foundation. This is an umbrella within the LF. Um, there's a project called Intersectional Fairness, which is focused on building a model that looks for, tries to detect bias in uh, the underlying data sets and the resulting models. Um, another example is the Singapore government, of all people, um, recently released an, uh, their own open source project called AI Verify to attempt to be an auditing tool for AI models on this kind of thing. So uh, we think this is great, and we really think there's a lot of potential for the open source community to very actively build safety and guardrails and, and other kinds of uh, functions into the tooling that developers are using to build AI models. Um, there's other parts of the executive order that speak to trying to address concerns about, say, fraud and deep fakes and the use of the technologies and before uh, malign purposes. Obviously, as open source software, you can't keep people from using the code for, for purposes that, that you, know, you might not agree with, right? Um, we've all long had a conversation about, well, what if somebody wanted to use Linux inside of a nuclear power plant or a nuclear bomb, right? Could we prevent that from happening? And really, the open source licenses don't allow you to limit usage. But there are things that we could do. So for example, um, uh, if the technology that generated uh, open source images um, or, or text uh, uh, embedded watermarks in that, that output just by default, you know, you'd always have to be able to turn it off. But if the default was to have it on and to use um, techniques uh, such as C2PA, which is a, a, um, uh, a way of attaching authorship to content to try to help discern. So here's the stuff generated by AI, but here's the stuff generated by humans and specifically by, you know, this person or that person and signed by a certain way. That we think would help bring a layer of integrity and trust to uh, content on the internet that would help people discern between what's real and what's fake. Um, finally, there's a real focus, well, actually two final pieces, a real focus on cybersecurity uh, uh, and, and attempts to try to make these models resilient to prompt injection, to, to other forms of, of vulnerabilities that might lead to, to really malign outcomes. And this is where alignment with the Open Source Security Foundation and techniques they've uh, really been championing, like, like software bill of materials and signed software components using SigStore and others, might provide that integrity check and that, that traceability that we think is, is super essential to, to making this secure. And again, so a lot of alignment there between what the EO is asking for and where the open source community is heading. And then finally, I'll say, you know, the EO notes very appropriately that there is a tremendous skills gap out there. The number of people who know how to build these kinds of models and effectively manage them is a small number of the, the software developers out there. The Linux Foundation has invested a tremendous amount uh, in developing training materials for uh, the, the open source projects that are a part of the LF, um, such as not just those under LF AI and data, but also PyTorch. We have a, a, a developer program now, a set of developer modules around PyTorch to help train and certify developers against that platform, which is the predominant uh, tool now used to build uh, large language models. Um, and we believe this is a really key thing. Every developer out there should be able to be uh, an AI developer, every data scientist should be able to pick up these tools and build an, an AI and, uh, uh, and data ops infrastructure uh, to be able to go out there and, 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 and do not only deploy this for their business, realize a lot of value from it, but to do that in a way that's safe uh, and, and secure and, and, uh, and, and hits all the kinds of uh, right kinds of messages and guardrails that we want to hit. Um, so, so with that, we think there's, there's a lot that we at the Linux Foundation in particular, but more broadly stated, the open source community can do to, to, to close that gap uh, in the skills out there. There are also uh, like uh, not using AI to engineer, you know, biological weapons and stuff like that. These things can go beyond not only just open source, but it also depends, you know, what you may define as you give example that using Linux in a nuclear submarine or a weapon. So it's kind of out of the scope. And then we can go to the laws of Asimov's, you know, a robot should not do these things, you know. So um, uh, how 
Let's look at it from the open source community perspective or look at it the vendor ecosystem perspective. How much impact will it be on the community versus it is more about vendors they have to worry about? I think concerns about the, the malign uses of AI are really something that you have to depend upon the last mile to, to, to both uh, enable the, the people who want to uh, do the right things with this technology to easily do them, make it difficult for those who might want to use it for, for, for bad purposes, right? But ultimately, uh, upstream from all that, there's not much we can do to keep the bad people from doing what they want to do, right? That's really something about the, that regulators, that law enforcement, that others need to do at the last mile. But this has always been true with, with open source technologies. You know, the, we've had this fight for 25 years about end-to-end -end encryption, and the concern was, well, if you could allow people to communicate uh, without the government being able to listen in, well, that would enable the terrorists and, and people sharing, you know, illicit images and things like that uh, I, and allow the bad people to do bad things. And probably there's been a bit of that, right? But we've gotten so much value out of these tools and we've built a lot of the security and integrity of modern society on the back of end-to-end -end encryption and public key encryption that, you know, we've evolved. We've been able to, 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 to make this, this the, the trade-off of risks and reward work. Likewise, I think with AI, We'll be able to find a way to allow the rewards to 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 really uh, shine and, and and overwhelm the <coughs> potential for risks and, and bad effect. This executive's, of course, order is focused on U.S. You also gave example. A lot of work is going on. China leads. You know, when you look at AI, what kind of effort you are seeing from other countries? What is good about it? Because in other cases, we have seen that the governments were chasing. You know, uh, I mean, spam calls. We are ha we have not fixed that. You know, your car insurance expiry is. We have not fixed that. So it's good to see. But uh, if so, we have to look at it number one from global perspective because it cannot be uh, just a U.S. based executive order is not going to do achieve much. A second part of the question will also be that uh, do lawmakers really understand the implications of AI? Of course, Linux Foundation organizations are there to work with them, help them, but we don't know what, how this generative AI technology will be used two or three years from now. But these are good foundations. So what do you think about these two perspectives? I think it's important that um, AI technologies be broadly accessible. I was at a meeting yesterday uh, uh, when, uh, with a number of uh, dignitaries and, and other important folks because we're hosting in San Francisco this week uh, the APEC conference, right? Uh, and uh, I was talking with the ICT minister for Uganda, who was telling me about how they use open source software across their government infrastructure uh, as a way to not only cut costs, but to uh, be able to do things and not be limited by you know, a vendor here or a big tech there to be able to use their own uh, Ugandan developers, you know, out of the, their own universities and their own uh, startup ecosystem to to push forward and, and build the things that government needs. And from their point of view, AI is just as important to their future as, you know, our White House in the United States views it as, as to them, their own, right? They want to use it to improve crop yields. They want to use it to manage energy better, right? And so this is what's great about open source software has always been. It's, it's, it's a digital Digital public good, right? This this concept of digital public goods is now something the UN and many international organizations have been championing, um, uh, and and the potential for this to really bring a sense of, of equity uh, across the globe to access to technology is 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 real and is visceral and, and is something where even countries like Uganda are coming up with a national AI strategy, you know, and they're working with their peers in Africa and in Asia and, 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 and in the West <clears throat> to come up with uh, strategies that, that uh, complement each other, that set common global standards for these things. So that's something we welcome, you know, that's something that we think we should find ways for the benefits to reach, even, even to countries like China who are investing quite a bit in this. Uh, and there's a lot of research being conducted in China, a lot of patents being filed in China around artificial intelligence, a lot that we can benefit from the, the, the work that they put into to, to these foundational models and these foundational technologies. So um, I, you know, I, think, I think we want to tap into that. And, and I think we've set up in the open source community a great way to collaborate globally uh, across these boundaries. And we should not shy away from that in this domain. Since you are also known as a nerd diplomat, I want to ask a kind of not diplomatic but political question, which is that the world that we are living in today, a lot of wars is happening, uh, you know, the world is realigning. Uh, what role do you see open source or Linux Foundation can play? Because a lot of things, they go beyond political boundaries, beyond political agendas. These are, these are things for 
all mankind. So while governments can fight and argue, uh, the, uh, some of these technologies, they should not suffer. So what do you see is happening and what are you folks are playing there? Because this is a very dangerous times. Right. Well, um, to paraphrase Gandhi, um, right, first they ignore you. <clears throat> and for the first 15 years, 20 years of open source software, we were able to to kind of get by with government ignoring us uh, while we built things like end-to-end -end encryption and we built the global internet and built the web and that sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> then they fight you. Uh, which, you know, I think we've gone through a period of open source software having to struggle for respectability, struggle, you know, even today in some ways for around the Cyber Resiliency Act and, and with, with um, certain, uh, certain folks in government who don't understand how uh, open source works or how we're a driver of innovation and a driver of economic potential. Um, I, and then Gandhi said, and then you win. And um, I don't believe we've we're, we've won yet, um, but but I see signs like I mentioned yesterday, where I met this ICT minister from Uganda, I met another um, on the technology uh, side of the Swiss government yesterday. Though there are lots of people in government now who, even if they're not technologists, understand the potential for open source software to be a driver for innovation within their own countries, a, a driver for government IT innovation as well. Governments need to become IT organizations in order to deliver services to their citizens now um, and need to be better interconnected with their peers, with other governments, other, other nations. Um, and this is this is a new day. I, I first started working in government in 2008, uh, uh, 2009, early 2009 in the White House under Obama. And I think I was the only person who had ever written a Python script <laughs> who worked in the White House when I first uh, uh, entered there. Um, uh, now, this is becoming much more common to see technologists in government um, recognizing this potential. And I, um, I'm really encouraged by it. Um, the recent moves uh, against kind of globalization, the recent moves, you know, in a very kind of nationalist kind of kind of direction concern me, of course, the concerns uh, people around the world. Uh, I, I hope we can rest on uh, the fact that we've always been global as an open source community and, and especially with support for so many languages now on, on so many open source desktops. I mean, we've got like Unicode support is great. I mean, all these things now that give us truly a global platform. Um, and I believe that'll persist. If you're a developer, you want a broader audience for your work. If you have a question, you don't care if the answer comes from somebody in a country like China, if it's the right answer to, to, to solving your problem, right? Uh, if it's the right kind of technology. So um, we'll, we'll, I think we'll weather this storm. And I think if we stay focused on objectively building great software that helps solve problems for our businesses and for society, um, we'll end up further ahead. Yeah, I think open source and I, you folks have played a very big role uh, to kind of build a fabric of bringing put people together uh, and kind of overcome some of these challenges, political challenges. So yeah, I, it's a very good foundation there, you know, for, for countries, organizations to collaborate. One thing that was missing from this executive order that has become a big issue, especially for generative AI, which is copyright and, you know, companies are blocking API. Uh, I don't want to go into a longer discussion, but the fact is the way we learn things is by reading, by talking. So AI has to learn too. Uh, there's a di totally different uh, copying versus, you know, learning. So what are your thoughts on that, number one? Because if you look at open source licenses, they are all copyright licenses, and more, more or less, you know, that's what it is. Uh, so for the growth of uh, AI, uh, we need that. At the same time, there are a lot of concerns among the people uh, which may be unfounded at this point. It could be misinformation. Of course, a lot of what happens all the time. But I want to hear your thoughts on that and why you felt that the executor did not feel that it was needed to address that at this point. So it's important to think about AI models as being two layers, right? There's the foundation models that establish the basic way that languages work, right? Um, that give a, infer a sense of common sense for a given, you know, what is, what is you know, what's, I, 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 you know, how does a little bit how society work? Um, I, I, it, it's just, it's this baseline, right? And for that, we've seen uh, data sets pulled together, like um, the, the Allen Institute has actually been doing great work in this. And here's, here's the, the, all of the content on the English language Wikipedia, right? Or the, um, the Hindi uh, language uh, Wikipedia or, or on, uh, uh, you know, the, the other languages, right? Here is uh, the corpus of books in Project Gutenberg, right? Here are all of these openly licensed uh, um, uh, data sets that can be used to create language. Now, things like ChatGPT were also trained on, and, and, and other models earlier on were trained on, uh, trained on things like Reddit comments, 
And so perhaps it's no surprise when you train on Reddit comments that you end up with occasionally these kind of dark, you know, kind of hallucinations and biases and that sort of thing, because I don't know, have you read Reddit recently? I'm, I'm kidding. Um, but, uh, but, but I think if we pick the right underlying data sets for the foundation models, and it doesn't have to be, I believe, the entirety of the web. Um, I think that we're going to get better and better at being able to train on smaller sets of data. That's certainly the direction research seems to be heading in. Um, you have these foundation models. And by the way, this is a place where government can invest. If um, a, go- a government in a country whose language is not one of the top 10 languages wants to see great support, they could pull together their, their own you know, corpus of text uh, and really work to develop enough data to build a foundation model for for, for you know, a non-top three language or top 10 language. Um, the second layer, obviously, are the more domain-specific. Think of them as small language models, right? Or small other, other types of machine learning models. And <laughs> there's a great paper out there called All You Need is Textbooks, which suggests that uh, uh, you can, in order to train a, a large language model on the fundamentals of biochemistry, maybe you just take the corpus of books that a biochemistry you know, undergraduate and graduate student are expected to read, feed that to the model, and that might be enough to allow them to, to the, that model to be somewhat coherent when it comes to discussing biochemistry. Um, so I, I, I'm really optimistic that we'll find a way through this copyright kind of issue by being able to build more discrete data sets, um, better software that can train on smaller amounts of data, um, and really work to develop uh, data sets where consent is very clear. You know, um, another good example is the uh, database of Creative Commons licensed uh, images from the Flickr archives, right? You know, Flickr CC licenses were the default. We could train that on, uh, and in fact, I believe that's the basis for quite a few of the uh, the image uh, uh, AIs out there. So um, when it comes to the executive order and public policy, I'm, frankly, I believe they, they're kind of waiting for the Supreme Court to sort this out. You know, um, 20 years ago when Google started, you know, crawling the web and building their indexes, it was ultimately the Supreme Court that said um, uh, Google's actions in building their index are legal, right? Uh, and offering that as a as a search uh, to to the public, you know, is a form of fair use. Uh, and that was a contested and 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 a controversial decision, but it allowed search engines to operate legally. Uh, and I think we'll see the same thing uh, emerge, where there's clarity that comes from. Supreme Court or other decisions that say, well, when something's published, especially under a CC license or under some other kind of clear consent license, they can be used to to generate these models. Um, But the most interesting kinds of data sets, obviously, are going to be the ones that are not fully public, the ones that have personally identifiable information in healthcare, in finance, and so many other domains, you have these privacy concerns. So as I said, I think we're going to have to um, get comfortable with the idea that there are some language models um, where the underlying data sets are not fully open source, just as we're comfortable today with the fact that I can run Linux on my laptop like I am now, and yet there's this binary bot blob uh, that's firmware, <laughs> right, you know, that, that um, I don't have the ability to, to see the source code of that is, you know, delivered straight and, and loaded into the uh, AMD or Intel chip, but yet I still think of this as an open source system, right? So... And I think I think that degree of sophistication is is arriving now uh, in the uh, AI ops uh, uh, kind of world. Last question before we wrap this up is that you have been through, you have been part of, you have been the driver behind a lot of revolution or you know technical you know that we have seen in today's world. Uh, I mean, we can go all the way to web and everything else. When it comes to AI, especially generative AI, has been around for a while now. Generative AI is kind of rekindling interest in that. What is scale of uh, innovation do you see? Is it the same scale as was the kernel, Apache, or you know Kubernetes? Or you see, the, hey, you know, it's just like NFT. You know, people will get bored of it next year. Or you feel no, this has massive potential there. I think this is a bigger deal than NFTs. Um, I, I, uh, 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 maybe we'll see NFTs come back. Who knows? Um, but I, I, in fact, we just formed something called the Generative AI Commons within the LF AI and Data Foundation um, to try to map out everything that's going on in, in the gen- generative AI space and figure out how can we, as an open source community, be helpful in driving not just innovation in this domain, but also, you know, think about the effect that Kubernetes had on the cloud ecosystem. It was not just about innovation and not just about uh, in, in, this terrific solution, but it was also somewhat about standardization. It was somewhat about saying, right, there are all these different approaches to managing cloud infrastructure and building gigantic cloud systems, but ultimately we need to condense on a couple of common toolkits and standards so that we get scale. 
so that we can really turn everybody into a cloud engineer, right? Um, and I think in the AI ecosystem, there's a lot of different tools for building models, for querying models, to for managing these pipelines. And we're probably going to see some consolidation over the next few years. And it could be that that's around PyTorch. It could be that it's around some other type of platform. Um, we at the Linux Foundation are formally agnostic about that, <laughs> um, you know. But we want to be helpful in in seeing if, as that consolidation happens, can it happen in a way that builds a coherent platform that is also a truly open source platform that as many people can build upon and then build interesting stuff on top of um, as, as possible. Brian, if I'm not wrong, you folks are also hosting a conference next uh, month uh, about AI. So talk a bit about the conference, who should attend that, and what is going to be the theme? Yeah, so December 12th and 13th in San Jose, uh, we're hosting the AI.dev event. This is a, a, an event focused on anybody who uh, is either at the core of building these tools for, for building AI models, for building machine learning tools, um, but also those who are using these tools and connecting them into their own applications, right? Um, we think it's really important that we reach out beyond that core because everybody's going to start uh, picking these things and plugging them into their tools pretty soon. So um, uh, it's a it'll be a pretty nerdy event. Uh, I think we'll spend more time on the on the nuts and bolts, right? less on the policy and kind of public messaging and that kind of thing. Um, but it's really going to be a place where we start to uh, talk about convergence, I think, as well um, of these tools into what are the common platforms, common systems. Um, our hope is that it grows into an event kind of like KubeCon. What KubeCon is for the cloud ecosystem, uh, that this is for the AI ecosystem. Uh, and we think with the, the Linux Foundation, we've got a great set of assets that, as a starting point, but we know we, we need to do and could do more uh, to, to push the open source AI community forward. And the event will be a, a, a key a key linchpin for that. Excellent. Brian, thank you so much for taking time out today to talk about the SG daughter and also the implications of AI generative AI. Thanks for all those insights. And as usual, I look forward to chat with you again soon. Thank you. Thank you, Swap. Take care.